Um, if you look at that, maybe we could just spend a few minutes with it. And if you, if you look at that, you'll see that the very first one talks about the temple. And what you would want to do if you want to show anybody how this works, you'd say, well, let's open the Bible to Exodus 26, 33, because you have it written right there. And then you could read to them about the outer uh, court, the inner court, and the veil, or the curtain. And then you take them over to the right side and say, OK, let's go to page 25. And then you open page 25 of your material. And material, that's, that's good. It, it's stuff. And if you open page 25, you've got a scientific explanation of the outer court, the inner court, and the veil, and the pia mater, dura mater, and arachnoid. And then the next one is, is cherubim. And you go to Exodus 25.20, as it says in your material. And in Exodus 25.20, then you'll show them page one and the comparison between uh, the cherubim and the seraphim. Uh, cher seraphim. The cherubim and the cerebrum. Um, the ark and the angels. Now you'd say, well, where will we find that in the Bible? Well, it says right there, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. So you look at 1 Thessalonians 4.16, and then you show the folks you're talking to, pages 2 and pages 14i. And you'll show them the angles, and you'll show them the arc, and you'll show them the definition. And at least you sort of, well, and you said, well, we're not, you know, we're not here putting this in stone, but we're saying this is pretty interesting and worthwhile of being considered. Then in manna, like I talked about earlier, 1615 in Exodus, and uh, milk and honeys at Exodus 3.8. And then you show them pages 5 and 6. And, and scientifically, there's a description there from, from Stedman's. And the 12 tribes in Genesis 49, 28, and the 12 disciples in Matthew 10, 1, and then show them page 7 and show them your 12 cranial nerves, okay? Then show them the pillars of the temple and the cherubim and the wings in 1 Kings 6, 27, and open page 10 with a picture of the cerebrum and the fornix and show them how the wings extend from one wall to the other. And then amen in Revelation. That's a good one to show them. That's in Revelation 3, 14. And then show them page 11, where it talks about for amen, or for amen, that goes through your body. And uh, people always have their mouth hanging open when you show them that one. The next one is the son and the bridegroom coming out of the chamber in Psalm 19.5. And then show them page 13 and 14a, where the thalamus is defined in the medical dictionaries as a chamber. And then a white horse of Revelation, uh, rather the tomb, the vault, the sepulcher, in 28, Matthew 28 and Ma Mark 16. And I've given you the pages on the right side to show them the fornix, and, and, and onward and down. And so you can see that the, 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 uh, the olive in Deuteronomy 2840 and the hypoglossal page, and also the pyramid. And on the hypoglossal page, you show them both the uh, olive and the pyramid. And then the middle chamber, uh, 1 Kings 6, 8, and the fornix. You show them a picture of the fornix right in the middle, and so forth. So that, I, I would hope, would um, help you in finding some specific things that you might find really interesting and probably you said, gee, I'd like to be able to share this with somebody, but I can't remember where you said this was or where that is or any of this stuff. And so here I think it makes it a little easier for you to you know, get involved and see where it is in the documentation and where it is in the Bible. Do you think it's, does that make it any easier? Yeah. Okay? All right. Is there Good. a 14I or is that 14A? There's a 14I. It is a 14I. Are there all those letters before it? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll get you. And then um, down at the very end is what we talked about last week, if you remember, about the sacrum and um, the sacred stone and so forth and so on. That was interesting. Um, we spent a couple of minutes because Rich um, showed me something about that. And if you, if you come up with something in the middle of this, don't be afraid to raise your hand and, and, you know, yell it out or we can talk about it right here. It's okay. Um, guys come up with a lot of neat stuff that I miss, and uh, so that's very important. I mean, I'm just giving you what I found some other places, and so for what? But anyhow, one of the interesting things that we talked about last week, if you remember, oh, let me tell you this. This, this, is in, this, you know, this to me is fantastic. Let me show you something absolutely fantastic. You've seen this before since we've started this, but now this new thought about this I think is absolutely fantastic. Go to page 16b. Albert, this is great. I was telling people this last night, and uh, you know, they, really, uh, they really got caught with this because it just came to me 
uh, that this is true. Uh, 16b is the hippocampus. Do you see that? Now, notice the hippocampus is the hem of the garment. We understand that. And notice that it is the location of Amun's horn. Okay, so in your brain, you have something there called Amun's horn. Now, you've got ample documentation throughout other pages of the material that Amun is the Egyptian sun god. The Egyptian sun god. If you go into Greek, it's Zeus. If you go into Christianity, Amun and Amen are the same one, and Amen is Jesus. How can I justify that? Because the Bible calls him Amen. So once the Bible calls him Amen, they're calling him Amun. But this is the important thing. Get this now. Are you ready for this? This is a Christian, Judeo-Christian country, so they say. There are more Christians running around than anybody. And there are more Jews, probably, in the United States. That are, but that's fine. What do they have inside of them? They say, Jesus lives within me. I don't know about that. But I'll tell you one thing, including the Pope. Amon lives within you. Everybody, every Christian, every Jew, everybody who doesn't believe has one God who's identified inside of their body, Amon. You see? And there's nothing they can do about it. I was talking to a lady last night who knew this Jewish rabbi. She said she's going to blow his head off when he hears this. <laughs> he won't be able to deal with this. Do you see what I'm saying to you? Here's a Jewish rabbi walking around. He doesn't have Yahweh. He doesn't have Jehovah in his head. What's he got? According to Sedman's Medical, he's got Amon from the pyramid in the middle of his head. And he can't get it out. You can't rip that out. You go in and the Pope. Who's the Pope got in his head? Jesus? Oh, no. Amon from the pyramid. Wait till he hears that. Sorry. And, 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 and it's in the medical dictionary. So there it is. I think it's great. And what does it mean? Everybody in the world, everybody in the world has the name of one God right in the middle of their brain. And it's Amon. That settles it. What are you going to do? Where are you going to find another one? There isn't another one. And if you say, well, all these passageways in the body, we know Amon is living, and the passageways are for who? They're for, for Amon. I thought that was pretty neat. I said, that settles the problem of who's dwelling inside of us. But the good part about this is if you want Jesus to be in there, he's Amen, which is Amon. And if you're a Greek and you want Zeus to be in there, he's connected to him. That's all the same. And yet these people are dropping People are launching Scud missiles at one another and dropping bombs at one another because of their religious beliefs, and they all got Amon on the brain. Oh. <laughs> Every one of them got Amon on the brain. And you've got the proof of it because you got it right there from the medical dictionary. And there's nothing you can do. So there's going to be a lot of people when they find that out blowing their heads off. How am I going to get this out of me? <laughs> and that's what people do. Oh, they'll, they'll move to, the, you know, they'll be the, the religious right will have a big uh, thing to change uh, this, the medical dictionary of the language of what's in your brain. You've got to change it. Ralph Reed. So anyhow, that's interesting. But what we looked at, well, we looked last week, and we were looking at this thing of five into one. And that's a very important premise in, in scriptures. Jesus takes five wounds of his hand, feet, and side. And when he takes the five wounds, he becomes the Christ. He becomes one with God. So we have the five to one. Uh, if you look at the construction of the temple and the tabernacle, you have the five curtains, you have the five boards, you have the altar, which is five by five. When you see the confrontation between David and Goliath, David takes five smooth stones and takes one stone and nails the beast in the center of the forehead, which is referenced pineal gland. Okay. Now, why is that important? What's being said there is you must take the control of the five senses. Because if you leave, if he only took four stones, maybe something he had said would have gotten him in trouble. Maybe something he saw or something he heard. So he took control of the five. And he was able to defeat the beast, which is all mythology. It's all allegory. It's all parable. But it's a beautiful thing. See, how much more is important when you understand the nature of the myth? You don't have to worry about whether there was a kid with a slingshot that hit a tall guy in the head with a rock. 
I mean, you know, that's irrelevant. But when you start then to understand that what it's saying is, if you take control of the five senses, you who are the child and the child within you will defeat the beast of the monster that comes against you, no matter how big that monster is. So that becomes very important. So it's psychology. It's God's psychology. We were talking outside a moment ago about uh, the, the, the Jesus myth. A lot of people have difficulty with that. Well, it's not really that they have difficulty with uh, the question of Jesus. Basically, the difficulty they would have is that is most people don't understand the nature of myth. What is the word? I think it was best described by Moses Maimonides, who was a Jewish theologian of the 12th century. And Moses Maimonides said, whenever you see anything written in our law that goes against your common sense, Stay there. God's trying to tell you something. Okay. Just the mere fact of a Jewish Messiah running around Palestine with a Greek name should have you stop and pause for concern. Why doesn't he have a Jewish name? And where did this name come from? And when you explore that name and you find out that in, in Greek each letter has a numerical uh, value, and his is 888, which means in Greek the mythical son. And you follow his career and his life duplicates the trajectory of the sun. Everything in the life of Jesus coordinates to the sun. His birth in, in, through Virgo, his crucifixion on crooks, the southern cross, his entombment, the winter solstice, his birth, December 25th, the end of the solstice, entering into the water of uh, John, entering into Aquarius, going on to select the fishermen, going on to Pisces, becoming the Lamb of God, going into Aries, sitting at the right hand of Father, Father in the northern hemisphere. That's exactly what the sun is doing right now. As it and then concluding his journey as the Lion of Judah as the sun enters Leo. But we've missed it all because we have concocted a story that there is some fellow somewhere. Did how many of you saw George Carlin last night? Mm -hmm. Carlin. <laughs> George who? George Carlin. Well, he had a great line. He says, I want to talk to you for a minute about religion. And you know, you know that. And George Carlin says, This is what you this is what you're sold, folks. There's an invisible man. <laughs> and the invisible man lives in the sky. And the invisible man has ten rules. And if you don't follow everyone, he's watching every move you make. And if you don't obey those rules, he's going to grab you and throw you in a pit. <laughs> and the pit's on fire. <laughs> and you're going to scream forever. Never, and you're going to scream for eternity. And God really loves you. <laughs> it was great. It was a priceless treasure, you know. He, he loves you. He really, he's going to put you in a pit with fire. The stories that you've been raised with that is so shocking if I tell you something, the stories you've been raised with that are so difficult for you to accept sometimes are because you've been inundated all of your life with literalizing mythology. If you're going to fight over whether Jesus lived, then you've also got to discuss whether Krishna lived. That's the same story. Or did Mithra live? It's the same story. Attis, Adonis, they're all the same story. They're all born of virgins. They're all died for the sins of the people. They all resurrected. It's all the same stuff because it's talking about the sun. But if you'll understand it as a myth, then you can follow the myth of the Jesus who says, you will know I am in you. You found that out. Amen is in you. And he's riding the white horse Hippocampus right where he said he would be. But see, it seems that we can't deal with Jesus unless we can prove that he lived. It's like when people talk about the pyramids. They don't talk about what the pyramids mean. They talk about how did they get the stones so high. Who cares? Who the heck cares? If you're an engineer, that's important. But you're not an engineer, most of you. So what do you care? The important thing is, what is the pyramid for? And then once you learn what the pyramid is out there is for, then you learn what the pyramid in here is for. And that's what's really exciting. So 
The question of whether Jesus lived or didn't live is pretty well settled by the fact that, as I said, here's a Greek guy who's the Jewish Messiah running around with Peter, Paul, and Mary. I would say, I don't think so. Because I don't know anybody by that name running around Palestine. You couldn't find a Peter, Paul, and Mary in Palestine today if you give them $1,000 to look for. There is none. But so what is it trying to tell you? It's trying to tell you this is a great myth that has deep, deep psychological uh, uh, importance to your life. And, and so do you understand it this way? Then you obey this, see? Because the first thing you've got a problem with here if you follow this story as it's given out by your religious uh, groups that you've been raised with, you've got a story of accusing somebody called God, who's a pretty big actor in this universe, of being incapable of forgiving anybody without resorting to violence, bloodshed, and torture. And that is blasphemy, and that's why your world is screwed up. And so you better do it your way and walk away from the group out there that is going to have to answer to some intelligence as to why did you tell people this? Why did you tell people and make them afraid of this creative force which is a force of good and gentleness and kind? Why did you do that? And I'll tell you, there's reference to this in the Bible because God said uh, through Isaiah, hey, why are you killing all these animals? Why, you got, why are you hurting these animals in the temple? Who, and then in Isaiah 1 verse 11, chapter 1 verse 11 says, who told you this? Who told you to do this? Who told you that Jesus had to be crucified on a cross in order to forgive you? Who told you that? It's the same people that told you that, that were running around in the Middle Ages burning old ladies alive at a stake. That's who told you that. Jesus is a myth, which means Jesus is a truth. And that truth is alive and within you. Yes, sir? Yeah, I, I wasn't going to say anything, but I got to Come on up here. Well, because I don't have, we don't have three and four cameras like NBC. Tuesday night. Turn around. Um, Tuesday night we were talking about um, the picture of uh, 4555 and the symbol for Ra in Egypt mm -hmm. is a circle with a dot in the center. And I'm sitting in my chair and that's exactly what that looks like. Uh, uh, you know, a circle mm -hmm. with a dot in the center. Um, and it's just, I had to say something because when we were looking at it Tuesday night, we had differences. Should we hang it this way <laughs> or this way? I said it needs to be a circle. Yeah, great. And, and I just had to say that since you were talking about the 888 in the sun. And good. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Rich. He has good ideas. Okay, the Easter Bunny. So, so just, just let, go, go, go along with this and say Jesus is the universal cosmic message of love, forgiveness, peace, and understanding and healing within you. And let's learn Jesus on his terms within us and not on the literalization of people who have caused so much problems. Jesus took the five wounds to become one. David took the five stones to become one. Jesus converted the five loaves and so forth. And then we found something very beautiful. Your vertebrae at the time of your birth has 33, what are they called? Vertebrae? 33 vertebrae. And that 33 vertebrae is actually the story, it's another part of the myth of Jesus. It's the story of Jesus coming down and going up to 33 years. If you look in the Bible, you see his ministry started at the age of 30 and went three years in the 33 vertebrae. But the important part of this was that if you remember back in the story of Jacob, Jacob was out in this place, wherever it was, and he took stones, a multiple stones, and he made them for his pillow. And when he went to sleep, he had a dream or a vision of a ladder going up to heaven. That's your spine. That's your vertebrae. And he saw angels going up and down. And that's the cerebral spinal fluid and so forth. And there at the top, he saw God, which is consciousness. And he awoke and he, he said, this is a holy place. This is a, this is, this is a place, a wonder place. And so, it, but then it says, he took the stone that he made for his pillow. No longer were there stones. The multiple stones had become a stone. And he made that a sacred stone, a holy stone. And we found that, and you have a copy of it on page, uh, whatever it is, 40, what, uh, 40. Did I give them a copy of that? Where's, isn't the vertebrae on here somewhere? Um, 
It's on page 39. You don't have 39? We didn't give you 39? Okay, you got 39. So those of you who don't have 39. But anyhow, there on, the, on, on page 39, you'll see one of the segments of the spinal column, 33 vertebrae, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral fused into 1. That's the sacrum. That's the holy bone. That's the holy stone of Jacob. And then, for your side, for you to have something special, you've got four fused into one, which is the fourfold nature, which is called the coccyx. So God's foundation is called the sacrum, and yours is the coccyx, and the word coccyx means cuckoo. <laughs> it really does. So, I mean, that's, that's appropriately spelled out for all of us, okay? But this is the important part. If you go to page 23, because remember we talked about the olive oil and so forth and so on. If you go to page 23 in the Bible, and you'll get to Genesis chapter 28. In Genesis chapter 28 and verse 11, all right? Genesis chapter 28, verse 11. He says he took the, the stones of that plate, put them for his pillow. Then he had the dream, and then he woke up. And you see in verse 16, the Lord is in this place. And then it says in verse 18, he took the stone he had put for his pillow, set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon it. And that's the olive oil. That's being the sacred. Now, if you look at page 20, um, uh, page 16, rather, of your material, on page 16 of the material that I gave you, you'll see that which is the chrism, the oil, the cerebral spinal fluid, which flows up to the hypoglossal and emerges between the olive and the pyramid. Remember we talked about how we anoint our head with olive oil. So it is extremely important to anoint your head with olive oil. But it is extremely important that you don't let anybody put any greasy oil on your face because that can give you blackheads and stuff like that. So don't do it, okay? Because dirt can sit underneath that. Say, get your hands off of me. I know how to anoint my head with oil. And say, how do you anoint your head with oil? If I meditate and I generate the fluid, the oil raises itself through the vertebrae, through the spinal canal, up to the hypoglossal, and exits at the point of the olive. When that when that oil exits at the point of the olive, it becomes olive oil, and I have anointed my head with oil. Now, how important is that? How important is meditation? How important is meditation? Meditation is important because there is no other way to get the oil up from the base, from the sacrum, up to the place of the pineal, up to the place of the hypoglossal, up to the place of the olive. That it only can be done from meditation. Look at page 180 in your Bible, and if you look at page 180, and you look at the book of Deuteronomy, all right, then look at how important this is. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28, and verse 40, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 40. And it says, you shall have olive trees but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olive shall cast its fruit. How many people that you, how many, ch how many churches have you ever gone to? How many, how many churches have you ever sent your children to? Where anybody ever instructed them about anointing their forehead with oil? And other than taking oil out of a Johnson's baby bottle or whatever, I mean, anointing their head with oil in the way that God created your body to be anointed with oil, by allowing the oil to rise up to the olive. I mean, I've given you, you have from Stedman's Medical Dictionary, at the point of the pyramid and the olive is where the hypoglossal nerve, which is the 12th nerve of the 12 cranial nerves, at that point is where the energy, where that oil that flows through your body rises up and becomes the olive oil and anoints your head. That's what anointing your head with olive oil is. But it says, no, you wouldn't do that. So then it says in verse 41, you shall beget sons and daughters, but you shall not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. Look at all the kids. Look at all the kids, not only in this country, but throughout the world who have gone into captivity. With every kind of mad type of thing, you got more drug outreach centers in this country than you got AMPs, for God's sake. And why? Why? For this very reason. And then we have a lot of people that, oh, well, you know, I'm a, I'm, I don't want to get, my kid is too young to go to meditation. That's a lot of baloney. 
That's not true. Because if you bring children into a meditative state, the children will start to instruct you on how to meditate because they are closer to that one true place where all of this originated. And so then it says, look, all your trees and the fruit of your land shall the locusts consume. Or, and so many of us, you know, the a period of confusion in our lives and so forth and all of the horrors that have happened around us. But then I want you to read verse 43. The stranger that is within you. Read that again. The stranger that is within you shall get up above you very high and you shall come down very low. And listen to 44. He'll, he shall lend to you. You shall not lend to him. And he shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. Why? Because you've never anointed your head with olive oil. And you can take your kids to a pool or to a creek and dip their heads in and think you're baptized and you're not. And you can smear mobile oil on your head if you want and think you've anointed your head with oil, or you can go out and get an olive and squeeze that on your head and you've never been anointed until you understand how to anoint with olive oil, until you understand how God created you. Why do you think the olive is in there? Why do you think the oil is in there? Why is the pyramid in there? Why is Amon in there? So consider the oil flows down from the brain, then back up from the sacral area, or the sacred, the second bone, the five, the sacred bone, the five into one. So let's take another look then. What I want to do, just for a moment, is show you something um, let me figure out how to do this. I'll put this here because I want to show you the uh, overhead again. To me, what's very interesting because we want to look at the fornix. And if you remember, if we look at the fornix, we can understand the fornix to be that center vault in the brain. It's a vault or tomb. You have all the documentation. And that center of the brain, the, Tom, Tom, the only energy that goes in or out of the fornix is for a mind. And then we found the fornax. And we found the fornax is the furnace. And so not only do we have the tomb, we have the place where the ram is burned so that we may pass over. We have the place of the perpetual flame. We have the place, place of the fire. And when we got into Stedman's, which you have there, we talked about how do we reach the area. And we talked about beta waves at 30. That's not going to do it. We talked about alpha waves at 14. That's not going to do it. And then we got to theta. And then we got to delta at 4. We came up with a very interesting word, which is delta fornicus. And I will just hold that. And then it, it described delta fornicus. And then it said commissura, I-S-S-U-R-A, fornicus. And these are the left and right bundles of the fornix. It is both sides of the commissura fornicus means the left and right side of the fornix. I'd like you, as we go through today, try to drill this into your head. Commissura fornicus. Commissura fornix. So anyhow, we had delta fornicus, and we said, wow. We knew the triangular shape of delta, and that this would take us then to the fornix. But then we discovered something really amazing. We discovered a constellation, and the constellation was called fornix. And the constellation called fornix has a star. The other night, uh, Charles and I were looking at it, and we found the star right in the where it should be, and the name of the star is Delta Fornax. And you have copies of that. If you don't have copies of that, then uh, you should see Joan about it. But let me show you, uh, let me just a little bit on that. Uh, let, let, let me show you what's interesting to me about this um, stuff that Rich gave. Now, th this is um, this the material. Is this in your way? Yes. Oh God! <laughs> okay, that's not in your way now. 
Now, I didn't bring the pointer, but anyhow, if you look here, you see the, the pyramid, and this is the king's chamber. That would equate to the thalamus of the brain, and that's where the fornix would be. Now, you have the documentation. I can't go over a hundred times, but in the middle of your brain is this fornix. Now, below the king's chamber is the queen's chamber, which is the hypothalamus. What's interesting about this is if you look here at where the fornix would be of the brain, and then you see the lines drawn up to Orion and Sirius. Let's concentrate on Orion. If you see here to Orion, what's, well, what's just interesting, if we go ahead and take this off, okay, but then bring here, now look, remember where the pyramid was? And you remember where Orion was? But look where Fornax is. This is Fornix. This is the same. This is the Fornix of the brain. That's the Fornax of the brain. And look where Orion is. Now, what's very interesting about this is that right here also, as we found Delta Fornix in the brain, right here also in the sky is Delta Fornax, which, uh, which I gave you a copy of. Now, look what happens if we take and we leave Fornax where it is, and then we take the pyramid and we set the pyramid See, you see where Orion is up there? Okay. And now let's set the pyramid and place the fornix right at the point of the king's chamber. And look where Orion it exactly do you see? Look look where look where Orion is. Okay. Now if I lift that off, you see where that is? Okay. Uh, well, let me let me do this this way, you know. Okay. Here then is Fornax, and here's the king's chamber. You're moving it. Okay. No, you've got to look at that. Yeah. Here's the king, that's it. Here's the king's chamber, and here's Orion. And look at the line that goes right to Orion. So here's the king's chamber, the pyramid, and here's Orion. Now take the top one off. Look at that. Fornax and Orion. It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Which means then, that's fine, John. We, we, we need, which means then, uh, what happened there? <laughs> I know, but you just can't walk away. You know? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. You said that was it. You didn't well, I know that was it, but that's not it. Yeah, I mean, that's it, but that's not it. That's it. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll worry about... Now, what happened when I said... Remember I said to whomever, God, whatever you want to call, I said, how do I know this is right? I mean... I'm going to tell all these people this stuff. I really don't know. And the next thing I came to in a scripture in the Bible, and it talked about God's fire in heaven between the rock that is broken and the hammer. And I said, great. And then I looked at this. And I saw over here the sculptor, and the C-A-E-L-U-M is the chisel. And there it is. So it really looks, it really looks good. Okay. <laughs> leave that, leave that on. And can you turn, yeah, lights on. So in. now, <laughs> can you see this? All right. Just try to see it, okay? Open to page 40. Now we got to get, you know, I need somebody up here to, yeah, I should have somebody up here to erase the blackboard or the whiteboard. But anyway. Okay, page 40, what I want you to, do you have page 40? Yes. Okay, if you look on page 40, I want you to think, now, now let's, let's get back to where we were. What is so important about this? If there is a fornax in the sky, and it is angled, angeled to Orion, and there is a fornix in your brain, what should it be angled to? I would say so. How are you going to possibly get your brain angled to Orion? What I've been doing, and I have no way to tell you exactly, but what I've been doing is simply using Orion as a mantra. 
going into meditation, closing your eyes in a dark place and just saying, Orion, 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 Orion. And let the brain take it from there and let the mind start to angle to Orion. Because I have to take this extremely seriously. The people that built the pyramids were not sheep herders. Somebody with tremendous advanced scientific knowledge built that astronomical knowledge and obviously anatomical knowledge. Now, what we want to then look at is the point of Orion. Okay, if we look at page 40, we see that an ion, all right, is a, an atom that has acquired a net electric charge. So a charged atom. Now that's interesting. Why is it interesting? Because if we look down at Fornix, who do we have entombed in the Fornix? We have Amon. And Amon's name, as we have documented elsewhere here, is also Atum. A-T-U-M. So in the pyramid we have atom, and now we have atom angled to ion. All right? And then, do you remember, let, let me see if you can, if this will, if you can deal with this in Genesis. God, could you say God is the catalyst? <laughs> you know what a catalyst is? The, that would start, God will say is the catalyst, and people, would be the final result. So the intermediate between God and people would be the atom. So we'll call it atom or atom. And we'll say that's the intermediate. All right? Now, if the catalyst creates the intermediate, the atom, and then after the atom is Created becomes an ion, then the, to back to the catalyst, and this starts re replicating itself, recreating itself. What I want to show you is the book of Genesis written scientifically. And so if you'll open to uh, page 42, let's read it. Page 42 of the material, all right? Page 42 is called polymerization, the chain reaction, three steps. Okay? You got it last week. 43. 42. 42. I'm sorry. 42. Okay, well, if you don't have it, we'll get it for you. But this is what it says. The chain reaction in three steps is triggered by a highly reactive agent called an initiator or catalyst. God. Okay? Deal with that? All right. A positively or negatively charged ion, the intermediate product, which would be atom, may be an ion, a neutra, or an atom. The second step occurs when the intermediate compound, atom, reacts with the original compound, God, to form additional intermediate products, you. All right? And then, as it says, in the final, uh, these steps are repeated, yielding final products as well as the continuing supply of intermediates, and we're here to prove. So in other words, what you just saw looking as polymerization as, as, as a scientific fact in your documentation is totally consistent with what it says in, in, in the Bible. And what's so important about that is because it is, a, it is a communion, if you would, between atom and ion. And here in the situation where you have in your fornix that, or that part of your brain, that which is amon, which is atom, now you understand the need for you to line up that part of you, which is the meditative state, with ion. And I would suggest that the inferences from the pyramid are that we line it up with Orion. Now, let's, let me ask you something. Let's, let's take a look at, at this. I have given you... Jeez. Page uh, 41, which talks about orgate, which is a logic circuit, computerized logic circuit. All right? OK. So then let's take a look at OR. And we have documentation also elsewhere that OR is light. Now, I'm going to give you documentation in a few minutes, but I don't have it right now, but let's just go with me. We have or, light, the circuit of logic. Now we have the word I. When Moses said to God, what's your name, what did he say? I, I am. Okay. The city of Heliopolis, the city of light, was known originally as O-N. 
you will have that documentation before you walk out of here. So then what we have is Orion, the gate of God to the city of light. Okay? The gate of God to the city of light. Look, who built the temple? Who built the temple? Solomon. Can you do this with me? The sun. Got it? The movement of the energy through the chakras. Got it? The city of light. Got it? Who built the temple? The sun who flows through the seven chakras to carry you to the city of light. All right? Now, that's that that's uh, gives you the goosebump. <laughs> but there it is. And when you leave here, you see, you don't know that Own really is the city of light. I'll give it to you when you leave here, and you'll get it out of a Christian dictionary. That's where I got it from. Okay? So, Om, Om. Okay? All right. Good. No problem. Now, so we see this gate, this place of logic. Orion is the gate. William Duran, uh, Joni gave me this book, in the 17th century described the pale light of Orion as the one spot in the night sky where the heavens shine through. The luminosity does not belong to Orion, but comes through an invisible crack in a higher astronomical sphere. I don't know whether it does or not. I don't know whether this guy is right or not. I'm just telling you, this is one of these things we got out of a book, and it could be. But the thing is, what we're seeing elsewhere about Orion being the gate would tend to support that. OR is the logic circuit of that gate. God and light angles to the fornix. So now what makes it so important is that if... If the gate of the God of the city of light is Orion, and Orion angles down to the pyramid where the fornax is, and then we realize that the fornix in us then would also need to angle to Orion, then we're being told exactly how we have to set ourselves up. And nothing that could stop you. Why would you not let your children know this? Why would you not be a part of this? Why would you even hesitate to be a part of this? By understanding now you know exactly how. And you change the direction of your antenna to Orion in the same way that you change an antenna on you. You just tell your mind to change it. Orion, Orion, Orion. And if you don't get it, nothing's going to happen bad. But if you do get it, you're going to have an angel of light flying between your fornix and Orion. And that's significant. Now, this is exciting. This is so exciting, it could take me back to my old roots as a fundamentalist, when I used to come down and lay my hands on people's heads, and people would fall all over the floor, and I had bodies all over here, and I would stand up and serve, and I felt like General Custer, and they were all over the place, and I said, God, look what I can do. I'm the hot stuff in here. <laughs> and these people were really... They may be watching, but I would go, bang, they would go over, bang, they go, bang, oh, they'd lay on the floor. But the problem I had with it is when I got off the floor, they were just as screwed up as when they fell down. So I said, that's not it. But what really stopped me from doing that is I was watching television one night, and Johnny Carson had the amazing Kreskin. And he's about as obnoxious as you can get the amazing Kreskin. You ever seen this guy? The amazing Kreskin says, I want to show you something, John. And he lines up six people. And he's got people behind him. And he goes down the road. Watch this, John. Boom, boom, boom. And they're falling over. And I said to Joan, Joan, Kreskin is born again. <laughs> he wasn't. He was showing that just how the power of suggestion can make anybody do whatever they want. I got a thing from a guy in Fork the other day. And he says, your beliefs create your reality. I have... I mean, to a certain extent, you know, you can have positive outlooks. But I thought to myself, if I'm in my car on a sunny day, and I believe that I'm going to have a nice day, and I'm driving the speed limit, and I believe I'm going to be safe and protect myself and my family and my car, my beliefs are creating a beauty. I'm going to have a picnic today. I may drive down to Atlantic City. As I approach the intersection, there's a guy coming down the other road. His beliefs are that he can beat the red light. His <laughs> beliefs are going to create a hell of a reality for me in about three seconds. I just thought I would, you know, throw it in there. Anyway. But anyhow, let's get everything in preparation. Because 
what we want to do is pray. Can you ever hear about praise the Lord? You ever see him on television? Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Praise you, praise you, praise you. This is what praise the Lord. But you know what is interesting to me? How can you praise nature? How can you praise the universe? How can you praise God? And, and, and you really should. How can you praise God the Creator for giving you the understanding that you have now? For allowing you to see the secret of this magnificent creation in His sky, inside of you. How can you praise God? How do you praise God? Now, do you remember we pondered reaching fornix? Now, please do this for me because this is going to be exciting for you. This, I think, is kind of a sock knocker. You got your socks on when you watch your socks on. I like to send you out of here with a little sock knocker, okay? Well, I thought this was one. But when we pondered reaching fornix, look at page 32 of your material. On page 32, we were taken to beta wave, right? Alpha wave, theta wave, and then we got to delta wave. And we went over to delta on page 33. And we saw Delta Fornicus. See it? And then we went down to Delta Fornicus, and it said it's the same as Commissura Fornicus, which is the left and right bundles of the fornix. And you can see that, the fornix bundles. So that was really exciting for us because we said, Delta can take us to the fornix. And then we looked up in the sky and found fornix and found a bright star at fornix, which is delta fornix. So, whoa, if it's up there, we got it in here. This is set. We're in business. But I want you to drill your head on this. Commissura fornix, that you know it's the fornix, okay? Don't have to worry too much about delta now, but commissura fornix is, is the fornix. And I wanted you to consider that, see? Okay. So that, let's go back for a minute. Let's do a real quick Bible jumping, and then I'll show you something. Because we want to find out, we, would you like to praise the Lord? Yeah. You really, I mean, really, because the Lord is the intelligence that made all of this possible and put it right there so you could find it. And now he, he she has allowed us to find it. So let's find out how we're going to praise the Lord. Let's go to page 478. And on page 478, let's look at Psalm 33, okay? Page um, 478, let's look at Psalm 33. Psalm 33, verse 2. Praise the Lord with the harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery, an instrument of ten strings. So we're going to praise the Lord with the psaltery. Now, a psaltery is an ancient stringed instrument, and we're going to praise the Lord with the harp. All right? Now, let's go to page 491 and look at Psalm 57. And on Psalm 57, let's look at verse 8. Psalm 57, verse 8 says, Awake up, my glory. Wake up, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake. Wake up, psaltery and harp. I will praise the Lord with the psaltery and harp. Wake up, psaltery and harp. Go to page 499 and look at Psalm 71 and verse 22. And in Psalm 71 and verse 22, I will praise you with the psaltery. I will sing with the harp. And then finally go to page 521. And there's others, but for the sake of time, let's go to Psalm 108. Okay, on page 521 in Psalm 108, verse 2, Awake, psaltery and harp. I will. So how are we going to praise the Lord? We're going to praise the Lord with the psaltery and the harp because that's the way the Bible expresses us. Now, there was a guy named David. Do you remember David? And David would play the, what they call the lyra, the lyra. The lyre is like a, like a little harp, and he would play that. Very interesting thing occurred. Let me show you what happened. Uh, page 250, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Page 250. This is the last scripture for today, so you don't have to go look in any place else. Page 250, 1 Samuel chapter um, 16, and look at verse 23. And it came to pass, 
when the evil spirit from God, from who? Whoa, you think you're in trouble? And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took the harp and he played it with his hand so that Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. How did the evil spirit depart? When David played the lyra or the harp. And how do you praise God? You praise God on the psaltery and the harp. I'm about, what page is that? I'm about to provide you with page 44 from Stedman's Medical Dictionary. When you look at page 44 in Stedman's Medical Dictionary, you'll see a definition of the psaltery, which is a ten-stringed instrument. It's an ancient instrument. You'll see a definition of the harp. At the bottom of the page, you'll see from Stedman's Medical Dictionary, Psalterium and Lyra Davidus, the psaltery, the harp, and David's lyre. And I want you, as you get it, just to yell out to me, what does it mean? Look at it, at the bottom of the page. What is it? The harp is, com is the fornix. And David's lyra is an obsolete term for the fornix. How do you praise the Lord? Look at it. I mean, it's throughout the entire book of, uh, it's, of Psalms, it's telling you, praise the Lord on the, on the harp. Praise the Lord on the psaltery. And now you've got Stedman's Medical Dictionary. And your brain is a psalterium, which means stringed instrument. It's a harp. And it's commissure of fornix. It's the left and right bundles of the fornix in the same way that delta is the left and right bundles of the fornix. In the same way that fornix strings and sings to Orion and plays the harp and prays to God, to Orion. God doesn't need you to lift up your mouth and say two words. He needs you finally to understand the Jesus who said the kingdom is within you. Practice the single eye. He needs the Krishna who told you to enter within yourself. He needs the Buddha who told you to find that which is what you're looking for within yourself and he needs you to do it by opening the line to Orion and stimulating the sound of the angels between the fornix and it is the fornix that is the psaltery and it is the fornix that is the harp and it is the God of this Bible who said praise him on the psaltery praise him on the harp start making music from the fornix of your brain <coughs> praise the Lord on the harp. Praise the Lord on the psaltery. Praise the Lord on the harp. Praise the Lord on the psaltery. You got it? You got it? You got it? You got it? Then do it! Boy, this takes us back to the Assembly of God days. I ain't done this. Charles, let it play. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you later. Okay.